When you think of autotune, what do you picture? Is it T-Pain? Or maybe more recent pioneers like Travis Scott or Young Thug? Maybe you picture Jay-Z's 2009 hit Death of Autotune. Autotune actually predates all of these by over a decade. GoldenEye 007 for the N64 had just released. IBM's deep blue chess playing computer beat Garry Kasparov, a chess grandmaster who had previously never lost to a human opponent before, and the first NASA rover landed on Mars. On September 19th, Antares Autotune is released. Wait, let's rewind a sec, because how this program got made is part of the story too. Andy Hildebrand, born on May 12, 1954 in Coronado, California, was a research engineer at Exxon, the oil giant, from 1976 to 1989. Before his time at Exxon, he attended the University of Michigan for his bachelor's degree in system science. During this time, he worked in Washington, D.C. for the U.S. Navy, where he developed a precursor to GPS technology called SRN-9. Later on, he became more interested in mathematics rather than hardware development, so he went on to get both his master's and PhD at the University of Illinois in electrical engineering. He wrote his thesis with the absurdly long title of Nonlinear Filters for Estimating an Insect Population Density. Following his graduation from UIUC, he started working in the production research sector at Exxon. He did some pretty complicated stuff at Exxon that I'm way too dumb to understand. After retiring from Exxon, he ended up attending school again, this time at the Shepherd School of Music at Rice University in Texas. During this time, he founded the company Antares Audio Technologies and developed the first version of Autotune. It was the first program that could, in real time, correct the pitch of anyone's voice. This completely changed the music industry. A quick side note here, the only reason Hildebrand even considered developing this technology was because his colleague's wife jokingly suggested that she could benefit from a device to help her sing. It goes to show that the simplest of conversations or events can cause such massive change. Anyways, I think nowadays when someone says autotune, they're not really referring to the specific software Andy Hildebrand created. Instead, they're referring to pitch correction in general, because in today's world, there are many, many different options for doing this. But it goes to show how ubiquitous the autotune program was and that it essentially became a verb that is still used today, like Google. Before this technology existed, sound technicians would have to take tens, if not hundreds of different takes of the same song and stitch them together to take the best parts or words from each. Not only was this time consuming, but it was incredibly expensive too. Autotune broke that barrier down and paved the way for individuals to be able to produce professional sounding vocals for relatively low cost and arguably birthed the modern pop, mumble rap, and SoundCloud rap genres. Whether or not you think that was a good thing is another story. Let's get a bit into how it actually works. When someone sings, their voice can be represented as a digital waveform. If the pitch of the audio is higher, there will be a shorter distance between each peak and valley of the waveform. The same is true for lower pitched audio, except the distance between the peaks and valleys will be larger. Autotune works by detecting parts of that waveform that are out of tune and shifts the waveform to match the nearest musical note. It does this by shortening or lengthening the distance between the peaks and valleys of the waveform to increase or decrease the waveform's resulting pitch. It must also add or remove portions of the waveform, because if autotune raises the pitch of the audio, the waveform will become shorter, and thus not the same length as the audio that was inputted. The same can be said for lowering the pitch. It will just remove part of the waveform to match the length of the input. However, it is a bit more complex than that because human voices are not a pure tone like a sine wave is. They have many different stacked frequencies. This makes it a lot more complicated for autotune to correct a human voice. I'm definitely not smart enough to understand the intricacies of how the program works beyond that short description, but here are some of the equations used by autotune to correct the pitch of a human voice. Yeah, holy f Anyways, that's enough of that. Let's get back to the more interesting parts of this video. Fast forward two years. It's October 22nd, 1998. Believe by Cher, the first commercial song to use autotune was crashing onto radio airwaves. The song's reception upon release was extremely positive. Publications cited the creativity of the vocal effect and it was described as present tense disco. However, the robotic sounding dance pop tune Believe was not actually using autotune for its prescribed purpose. It had originally been created to subtly fix imperfections in someone's vocal performance. A quote from the patent for the software reads, When voices or instruments are out of tune, the emotional qualities of the performance are lost. 
That description is vastly different from how the software is used today and in the song Believe. Because the effect was used in such a creative way, critics described her performance as nothing like she's ever done, and a club track so caffeinated it not only microwaved her cold career to scorching hot, but gave dance music its biggest hit since the days of disco. I think this perfectly describes what autotune did to the music industry. New tools breed creativity and lead to the making of new and innovative pieces of art. After Cher's Believe was released, there were relatively few artists who were taking advantage of autotune for quite a while. There was the odd album here and there, like Radiohead's 2001 Amnesiac. Their goal was to create a nasally depersonalized sound, and the lead singer was quoted as saying, the software desperately tries to search for the music in your speech and produces notes at random. If you've assigned it a key, you've got music. Not exactly a ringing endorsement. However, during the early 2000s, autotune was fairly low key. It wasn't until later that it exploded into the musical mainstream and caused many controversies. The date is August 9th, 2005. T-Pain comes out with his hit single, I'm Sprung, which would reach number eight on the Billboard Hot 100. This would be the first time autotune was thrust into the mainstream of the music industry for listeners, artists, and labels alike. This opened the floodgates and exposed the software to pretty much anyone who listened to music. Even your grandma probably knows what autotune is because of T-Pain. He continued to release a metric load of hits taking advantage of autotune and defined his sound using the software. If you lived through the mid 2000s, you would know that T-Pain was almost inescapable. When I say that, I am not joking in the slightest. This dude had an absolutely insane number of songs on the Billboard Hot 100 at any given time during the mid and late 2000s. Throughout his career, he had 48 songs in the top 100. 15 of which were top 10, and 3 of which were number 1 hits. Songs like Buy You A Drink, I'm In Love With A Stripper, and Bartender were all defined by his unique robotic sounding vocals and incredibly catchy R&B inspired pop beats. It's safe to say that the mainstream music listener not only loved T-Pain's writing and musical style, but also the autotune sound. Again, with T-Pain, autotune was being used in a way that it was not initially intended. Rather, it was being used as a creative style choice. Things were good for autotune, it was incredibly popular, well liked by most artists and listeners, and it was a new creative tool for people to dive into. But things weren't all good though, there were plenty of criticisms of autotune as well. Let's fast forward a bit to 2009. Jay-Z released his hit single Death of Autotune on June 5th, 2009. The song was about the overusage of autotune in popular music. While Jay-Z stated that he appreciated the use of the software from talented artists with an ear for melody like T-Pain and Kanye West, he thought far too many people had started using it for no other reason than as a crutch for not being able to sing. Jay-Z also said that one of the main inspirations for the song was seeing an advertisement for Wendy's that had used autotune in it and that made him feel as though autotune was once used as a tool for creativity but was now a gimmick. Jay-Z wasn't the only one who had problems with autotune. Many artists and listeners alike were opposed to the software being used as they thought it removed all of the talent from music. Artists like Death Cab for Cutie, Christina Aguilera, and Usher were critics of the software. T-Pain had said in an interview that Usher at one point told him that he f***ed up music for real singers while they were on an airplane together. Not exactly something you want to hear as an artist. It had sent T-Pain down a spiral of depression and confusion because at the time, Usher was his friend. T-Pain even questioned himself after that moment and began to ask himself, wow, was he right? Did I f*** up music? He was like, man, I want to tell you something, man. I was like, what's, what's, what's good? I thought he was about to tell me something real. He sounded real concerned. He was like, man, you kind of kind of f***ed up music. I didn't understand. Usher was my friend. He was like, nah, man, you really like, you really f***ed up music for real singers. Literally at that point, I couldn't listen. Is he right? Did I, did I f*** this up? Did I f*** up music? Even Time Magazine had quoted an anonymous Grammy-winning recording engineer saying, let's just say I've had autotune save vocals on everything from Britney Spears to Bollywood cast albums, and every singer now presumes that you'll just run their voice through the box. Time Magazine had listed it in their top 50 worst inventions list in 2010. Autotune had become so ubiquitous that it became rarer to record with an artist not using it than with someone who does. 
However, there were still a number of people supporting autotune and praising it as another tool in a music producer's arsenal to bolster creativity and help push people over the vocal cutting edge. It's safe to say there were many people on both sides of the aisle when it came to whether or not autotune was a creative tool or a piece of garbage that had ruined the music industry. Autotune itself would continue to be updated by Antares over the years and gain new features along the way. Originally, it was only capable of real-time pitch correction with no editor for individual syllables or notes. The algorithm was improved, and each iteration made it easier to save less than savory vocal performances without making them sound completely robotic. Eventually, it became more complex, gaining features like better vibrato control, the ability to generate its own vibrato, a humanized knob, format shifting, and the ability to target specific notes. It was eventually expanded to include a MIDI graph editor so that engineers could precisely edit specific syllables in pitch, length, and timing. This type of MIDI graph editor is what is more common today and is vastly different from what the early versions of pitch correcting technology was capable of. With the MIDI editor, you were able to precisely edit a vocal performance and focus in on extremely small details so that you can do the least amount of editing possible. This allows you to enhance the performance without removing the soul and human element. Now that we've gone over the early days and the explosion of autotune in the mid 2000s, I'd like to take a bit to talk about how pitch correction software is used today and some alternative pitch correction tools. Software in today's world is more complicated and amazing than ever before. There are literally hundreds of pieces of software people have created to help mold and perfect people's singing voices. Here's just a few of them. In modern pop and more broadly music in general, pitch correction is used for a vast majority of artists. However, it may not be used in the way you may think. Instead of using it as a crutch or a style choice like T-Pain with his robotic sounding vocals, it is used as a tool to control a performance and enhance it. I'd like to go over an industry standard piece of software called Melodyne that I personally use when working on people's vocals. Melodyne does not work like a live pitch correction tool. Rather, you import vocals into it and you can control precisely where each syllable lands on the pitch spectrum, among other things. You can make the performance perfect pitch, do slight adjustments, control vibrato, control sibilance, and retime vocals that were sung slightly off time. If used sparingly, it can take a decent vocal performance and perfect it without introducing any type of artificial sounding artifacts or vocal pops. It is incredibly good at keeping vocal performances natural sounding and does not morph someone's voice into something unrecognizable. Here's an example of me singing with Melodyne applied to my voice over a beat that I made. For reference, I cannot sing at all, not even a little bit. Squash, shut up. Remember the times that we used to fight in the summer nights. I looked in your eyes. I asked if you'd be in me. Yeah, my curiosity, it got the best of me. You ain't gotta show me. Yeah, I think I'm into you. I don't know what to do. I am so lost with you. I cannot be. To a trained ear, it is probably apparent that some amount of pitch correction is being used here. However, to the average listener, it may not seem like anything was done at all. It is extremely impressive that a tool like this is able to make it sound as if I can actually sing without completely butchering the soul and tone of my voice. After working with this software for such a long time, it still blows my mind almost every time I use it. I think that autotune and pitch correction in general gets a bad rap from people. I think it's totally fair to not like how it sounds or think that people who use it can't sing. But I also think it's important to recognize that this one tool changed music forever and has a lot of really cool applications. With this technology, we got albums like Discovery, 808s and Heartbreak, and The Carter 3. In my humble opinion, pitch correction is another tool added to the arsenal of tools that producers, engineers, and artists can use to realize the vision that they have. I also think that art and media changes over time, and this is one of those changes. I think every generation has their own revolutionary ideas and inventions that push art in a new direction. This might be a hot take, but I think autotune is this generation's rock and roll. Think back to when rock and roll was first emerging. People absolutely hated it and thought that it was ruining music, and the same can be said for autotune. I personally cannot wait to see what's coming next for music and see a new generation of artists, producers, and engineers evolve music even further. Thank you guys very much for watching, stay safe out there, and I'll see you in the next video.